Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Aha, fantastic. We've got a moth returning. Excellent. It was attracted to the light as we put it on. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Natural History Museum. My name is David. I'm your host for today's Nature Live. Now, before we get going, can I just ask that mobile phones are either turned off or put on silent? I think I've done mine. And uh, just to ask that there's no eating or drinking, ideally, in the studio, just because we've got a few specimens out. Today, you're very lucky that we've got two filmmakers that have come to talk to us about their beautiful documentary, Cocooned Secrets of the Spanish Moon Moth. So please don't be shy. Stick your hands up at any point if you've got questions. This is about your chance to find out more about the museum and some of the people that we work with here. So that's enough from me yabbering away. Uh, Alicia and Ben, uh, thank you so much for coming down and, and talking to us about this beautiful specimen and your documentary. Perhaps we can start, um, Alicia, uh, actually, yeah, we'll start with Alicia, by, um, because you're actually a, a curator here. At the yeah, I'm a volunteer oh. curator Excellent. in the moths and butterflies department. So what does that involve? And also, how did you get into, into this in the first place? Uh, well, I've always had a passion for the natural world. I've always been, well, when I was a child, I'd be in the garden looking for bugs. And that kind of <laughs> led to me getting a work experience placement at the age of 17 here as a curator and I kind of kept in contact with people at the museum and ended up back here doing more <laughs> of that work, looking and after the specimens. And how are most of our specimens, for example, in the butterflies and moths, how are most of those preserved? Uh, they're kept in drawers like this. <laughs> so these are hawk moths, is what I mostly work with. And so they're pinned and onto this foam board into the drawers and there's just hundreds and thousands of rows of them in the museum. Uh, they're kept in cool conditions and in the dark so nothing can, you know, decompose them. And some of the specimens, I'm not quite sure how old these are, but some of them have been in our collection for hundreds of years and they still look almost exactly the same as the day that they were captured as well. Yeah, Excellent. it's incredible, yeah. Brilliant. Um, and Ben, have you got a similar sort of story in terms of, uh, have you always interested in the natural world? Uh, yeah, since I, was a, since I was a kid, had a real interest in the natural world, always going out, getting hands on, seeing what I can find. Um, very enthusiastic about insects, as you can see. That was like, a really good day for me. Um, <laughs> but yeah, a, a huge enthusiasm for it. And I'm, you've just kind of got a brain that's like a sponge, just kind of absorbs that kind of information and retains it. Um, awesome. Yeah. And, and Alicia, I know that you went on to study, was it zoology at university? Yes. Yes. Uh, cool. And you sort of took the sort of academic route, uh, but Ben, you've, you've mainly just sort of gone out sort of as an amateur on your own. And, but yeah, just that yeah. Route. It basically started by like my mum doing gardening and finding something and going, what's this? And then I'd like be like, oh, well, that's a cocoon of like a species of moth or something. But um, I've always had a curiosity for that kind of thing because there's a whole world out there of different species and I always love to kind of tick things off that I'd seen yeah excellent it's nice to show that there's not just one way to get into this sort of thing lots yeah. of different routes that you can take mm. now the the film uh, we're going to look at clips of uh, soon cocooned secrets of the Spanish moon moth this isn't your first project um what other uh, little projects have you been working on well we did um a few pieces on invasive species in the UK Te technically they're not invasive because they're not doing any damage to our like environment here but this is, um, this is a picture of me in um, the Isle of Man. We were, actually went to film redneck wallabies, which were actually originally from Tasmania, but now they're living and breeding in mainland UK. And particularly on the Isle of Man, there's a huge colony of them on the Isle of Man. And we even saw a mother with a joey, so it proves that they're actually breeding there as well. So it's crazy to think that... I mean, I didn't know they could swim. Um, <laughs> yeah, they're really powerful swimmers. Can... Yeah, yeah. How, how does a wallaby end up in the Isle of Man, um, Alicia? Do you, do you know? Oh, they were used as like ornamental animals in estates and wildlife parks, and then they got loose uh, over the hundreds of years they were there, or a couple of hundred. And now they just like they found themselves quite comfortable in our environment. It's quite similar from where they come from, and they're just thriving. Yeah, <laughs> it's incredible. It's crazy, yeah. yeah. And some of the other invasive species that you've been looking at, a little bit smaller. Uh, where was What's this, and where was this one from? That's me holding a uh, yellow-tailed scorpion, which is actually a Mediterranean species of scorpion that, that, that lives in the UK. It can be found around different docks in the UK. They actually come off of ships um, and make their way into like cobblestone walls in some of the older docks. Um, and yeah, they're not, they're not too 
deadly, hence why I'm holding it. But um, if it did sting you, it'd just be like a bee sting or something. But yeah, like again, another species that is kind of out of place in, in the UK. And this is one of the, the themes, actually, of your documentary, something that doesn't seem to be as though it's meant to be there, something that's out of place, which moves us beautifully on to talk about the Spanish moon moth. Yeah. Um, now, how did this project get started, Alicia? Because you've, you've brought in your sticker book from, <laughs> from many years ago. Here. Yeah, so when I was about seven, I got this sticker book, and it was just the most beautiful animal in it. It's all about bugs, and from then it's been my favourite moth. And me and Ben met when we were volunteering with Essex Wildlife Trust doing um, woodland management. And he asked me what my favourite moth was. And I said, the Spanish moon moth. And he said, do you want to go find it? And I said, yep. We should went and out. We went. <laughs> <laughs> Off we went. No, it was, it was a really intriguing species for me. And I think um, we both have a very, um, we, we're both very passionate about Lepidoptera, which is the study of moths and butterflies. And it just felt like, you know, that's the kind of documentary we'd be able to successfully do together. And I love that. You know, you don't have to be the BBC, you don't have to be Sky. I want to go and find this moon moth. Let's go and find it. And, and let's have a look at the, at the real thing. And this is a specimen from our museum collection on, on the visualiser. Oh, I like that response. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. So first of all, we can see we've got two there. Would anyone in the audience like to guess? So one is a male and one is a female. Would anyone like to guess which is which? Yes, at the back. Top is the male. Do we agree with him? Yep. Yes? No? Okay. <laughs> Some, someone says no. Uh, which one's which? Uh, yeah, that's, that's correct. This one is the top. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this is the top. <laughs> this is the male. Uh, and how do we know? You uh, can tell by looking at the antenna, almost as big as its body. They are used to detect the pheromones of the females, which underneath you can see ooh, has... Ooh, if anything, they're just like strands of hair coming off of its face. Uh, so you can easily tell the difference between sexes that way. Or you can also look at the end of the wings. You see, the males have these long tendrils, whereas the females don't. Now, these long tendrils, if we can take another look at those. Yes. Um, what do we think these are actually being used for? Do we know? Uh, there's a theory that, uh, so if you look at other species of moon moth in South East Asia or South America, they have much longer tendrils and uh, you can kind of see in this species, but in other species it's more apparent that they have folds and so it gives the end of the wing a 3D structure and these moths are preyed upon by bats which use echolocation to find their prey and if it's got a body and also this 3D lump away from its body, it, there's a 50-50 chance that it's not going to actually eat the animal, it's just going to eat its wing, which will allow it to survive. And being uh, such an isolated species, uh, it has changed from its relatives which have the longer tendrils. So now we've got this with a slightly shorter tendril, but still enough to determine which is male, which is female. Here's That's an example, example of the moon moth with the longer tendrils. Beautiful. Yeah. And can we find this one in Spain as well? No. Unfortunately, <laughs> no. Some, something else that's actually really interesting about um, these species of moth is, as you can see down here, they've got, eye, they've got little eye spots on them. Over, over millions of years, these eye spots have evolved to look like the eyes of predators. And something that's really incredible, you can't quite see it on this species, but some of them even have a little licks of like white scales on them, on them to mimic the reflection of like light in an eye. This species down here, the atlas moth, which is below the two Spanish moon moths, the sides of this moth's wing, as you can see on the top left wings, they've actually evolved to look like the head of a snake to deter predators, which has obviously taken millions of years of evolution, which I think is incredible from off to uh, evolve like that. So yeah, they've got some really cool features on them. Excellent. And the Atlas moth is cool, but I still think that the, uh, the Spanish moon moth has got a certain charm. Um, yeah. So we're going to stick with that one for the time being. Um, where about, uh, well, when you sort of decide you're going to go out and look for this, how do you know where to look? Where can we actually find it? Is it, is it just in Spain? Um, it's, it's only native to Spain. Um, it, it, it can be found in other places like France, 
Um, but they, it, it's believed that it was introduced there by people, but it's only native to the mountain ranges of Spain. Um, there's actually four main locations where it can be found. We've got a little animation, actually, which, can, yeah. which is part of your film, and you're going to explain exactly what we're looking at. Yeah. So um, in this animation that comes up, this is just a drawing of the um, span of the populations in Spain. So we've got the central system, which is where we actually filmed a documentary in Spain. We've also got the uh, Betic Mountains, the Iberian system in the Pyrenees. And these are the four main locations where the populations of the Spanish moon moth are found. But only within four lo locations in Spain is actually quite low. So you really have to go to some specific spots to see them, which we didn't actually find out till we got there. But the most interesting thing is to think about where it potentially came from. So yeah. correct me if I'm wrong, there are no close relatives anywhere near these populations in Spain. The closest relative is in North America. Yeah. Okay. So how on earth did it get from North America then to, to, to Spain? Really good at flying. No, <laughs> no. It actually, the, um, its relative was believed to have come over during um, the Ice Age. So when the seas were frozen over um, and the land was kind of formed together, well, not the land, but the, the seas, um, it's believed that it travelled across the permafrost and ended up in Spain. It would have been more widespread during the Ice Age, but as the temperature increased and the snow and the ice melted, it became isolated to the colder region, regions in the top of the mountains in Spain. Just sort of a relic of a, of a greater population yeah. that used to exist. And do, how many thousands of years ago, we I'm not too uh, clued up on my Ice Ages, how many years ago was that? The last Ice Age spanned from about 100,000 to 10,000 years ago. So it's a big... I don't know, time <laughs> to work with. And inspired by this idea of it coming over from the Ice Age, uh, Alicia, you actually created this lovely little drawing and, uh, of a way that potentially it might have moved over. Which yeah. Is, uh, <laughs> yeah, an artistic reconstruction of yeah. those times. <laughs> <laughs> we actually do have, uh, to re reference that, we've actually got a, a real mammoth uh, tusk there, woolly mammoth tusk there. Yeah. Um, so who knows, That's you know, we might have had... A Spanish moon moth uh, on the tip of that. Just ago. put that on there. <laughs> <laughs> right, so let's get back to your adventure. Well, actually, has anyone got any questions before we take a, a look at things? Yes. What's the difference between a butterfly and a moth? Oh, right, right back to basics. Yeah, good <laughs> question. Well, technically, none. They're the same. So when we went to Spain, nobody knew what a moth was. It was just butterfly. Everything's a butterfly. Mm. Um, genetically, yeah, there's not a lot of difference at all. It's just butterflies are day-flying moths. Uh, and even some moths that we consider moths are day-flying as well. So, yeah. basically so in no Spain, difference. Well, they're called mariposa in Spain, and mm. moth is just called, what is it, mariposa? Mariposa. Yeah, mariposa. So it's yeah. like, we'd say moth, we'd say butterfly, and they'd be like, mm. So, it's, yeah, the same thing, same thing out there. If you're much. thinking about, tech, like, I don't know, just for familiarity, uh, moths tend to have the more feathery antenna, which you can see on the male, not so much on the female. And I always think the best way of identifying them is that they don't close their wings like a butterfly. So a butterfly, when it rests, it will do this. And the moth, it will kind of close its wings like this. If you can see, yeah. Nice little tip there, yeah. So you can look at the way the wings form and the antenna. And I know butterflies normally have a sort of a I'll try and show you here a sort of clubbed antennae at the top there, but not always. There's Some no moths have my exactly, antenna like that yeah, as well. Yeah, it keeps yeah. you on your toes. Okay, good yeah. question. Right, let's get back to your adventure. So you went out um, into the central region. What sort of habitat do we expect to find these moths in? Well, mainly uh, pine forests. Um, this is a great picture of one of the environments that we're looking to try and find the species. Um, the actual caterpillars of the moth feed on um, Scots pine. Um, and also they feed on, what was the other one? Black pine. Black pine as well. So we, we had to go to areas that had these species of trees trees around, yeah. Can you sort of attract them out from the pine forest at all? Not um, from the forest, but down from the trees? Yeah, down from the... Well, we, um, we used something called a light trap or a light lure, which is basically like a sheet with a light shone on it. Um, Got a bit of a clip from your video as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. To show that. Um, and that's the convenient fact that moths are attracted to... To light. to light, yeah. So we just shine a really bright light onto a sheet. This is a moth trap that we actually pinned up between two trees, but you can also lay a sheet on the floor and have a light on the floor, and moths 
will attract get attracted to that. But we um, we use different we use different techniques in terms of the lighting. Excellent. So you knew you were in the right sort of area. You were in the right sort of habitat, the pine forest. You set up your light trap. Presumably, you found loads of Spanish moon moths. No, no, we didn't. <laughs> no, unfortunately, we didn't find them at first, um, which was kind of surprising to us. And this is one of the things that really shocked us. And also the guide that we were with in Spain called Miguel. Um, and this is when we really started, you know, our ears kind of pricked up and we thought, oh, well, this is really interesting. Um, and then on further research, we found out there may have been some causes to us why the moth didn't appear. And what were those? Um, presumably with Miguel's help, you were able to sort of understand a little bit more about the needs of this moth. In yeah, well, we found out that the moth needs snow to develop, basically, over uh, <laughs> winter. Uh, the pupa develop sun so the caterpillars crawl down the bottom of the pine trees and they pupate at the base by the roots and they need a cover of snow to develop they need a temperature of about minus nine and this year well the year we were there the previous winter there had been no snow and so in the areas that we were looking with Miguel uh, we didn't see any but you know we did go to some other areas that had snow and it is it successful. possible that climate change might be affecting things as well? If things are warming up, there's less snow? Yeah, yeah potentially, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Are there any other threats at all or reasons that the numbers have gone down in this population? There's, um, there's one theory that it might be um, the use of insecticides. Obviously, insecticides aren't good for insects. And um, this, is, this is actually um, a structure made by a processionary moth. And the processionary moth moths they come in there like millions in Spain they're, they're, they absolutely shroud different areas they're actually known to be extremely irritable so there's actually hairs on the caterpillars that if the moth is eaten by say farm animals or pets or even touches human skin there'll be a really painful rash there so when these species are being exterminated it's a possibility that insecticides they're very like potent insecticides they're indiscriminate yeah like they so, kill everything yeah so that's a chance that that could also be a reason why the species um might not have appeared when we went to find it. There's a problem in that we don't have enough data, really, to fully understand these things. Which is no. why we no, need, yeah. you know, projects like yours and scientists going out collecting and studying these animals as well. OK, so you didn't find any. Um, did you just pack up your kit and come home? Um, we were really determined. Um, we actually only booked five days out there, naively, because it turns out finding an elusive rare species is really difficult. Um, and, yeah, so... After, like, five days, we decided to, like, miss our flights, stay out for another week. Yeah, well, we, we came into contact with somebody that, act, well, that knows exactly where to find them, yeah. and he breeds them in captivity. He's an expert on the moth, been studying them for 40 years, and he told us about his last trip out to find the moth, and it was the week after, like, we were meant to go home. Literally, we found and this it was guy on the last home. day we were there. Yeah. yeah, it was either go home and don't get the footage or stay another week and potentially get the footage. And he had an interesting way of attracting male uh, moon moths, didn't he? What was, yeah. what was his special trick? He used the lady moths. So he, he, um, he captive bred moths um, to re-release into the wild to help stabilise different populations that were declining. So this is a female, same as the female down here. Um, and what he did is these, these females, he'd bring them out with them into the field when trying to find the moths, the wild Isabelle, um, or the Spanish moon moth. And um, they'd release pheromones. They'd release pheromones which the males would be attracted to. He'd also, he also used the light trap like us, but it was much more potent. It was a much more brighter light. But this technique, well, we saw more than one. It was brilliant. It was absolutely spectacular, the amount Excellent. of moths it brought in. So yeah. with a bit of help from, from it's Pedro, wasn't it? Pedro yes, and, and Jose as well. Pedro and Jose. And a little help from these sweet-smelling uh, females, you were yeah. successful. And we've got a clip, actually, of the moment that you actually saw the um, yeah. Spanish moon moth, which we'll show for you now. So we were off talking to Jose. Uh, we were pleasantly uh, interrupted. January, February, look, look at them. We've just seen our first Isabelle. They, they kind of even look a little bit prehistoric. This is the Spanish moon moth. One of the most stunning moths in the world. We're here with Pedro, who's a professor and an entomologist <laughs> that has been studying these moths for years. 
Um, Pedro, um, what can you tell us about this moth? This moth? See, si. It's the oh. Isabelina. Isabelina. Yeah. Isabelina. <laughs> Yeah. I love that. You're expecting something quite yeah, it's like this from Pedro there. Expert that's been studying them yeah. for forty years and yeah. it's like brilliant response. Uh, so but I think we should say uh, uh we were calling it Isabella and Isabellina. That's due to its Latin name, which is Graelsia Isabelle. And yes, um, we've actually overlooked something quite significant. Which yeah. is the the person to formally first identify it. And you mentioned in there, perhaps you can tell us the story yes. of Alicia. In 1849, an entomologist called Mariano Grails was walking through the, the very same pine forest that we were walking through with his dog. And his dog ran off and came back with this beautiful creature they'd never seen before. And uh, that was the discovery of the moth. And yeah. he called it after himself, Grails. So that's where Graelsia comes from. And Isabella, after the Queen Isabella. It's a sort of tribute to the Queen as well. Mm. Now, I thought it was bad practice to name a, a species you found after yourself, but presumably Grails didn't mind about that. It's just such a great just, species. Yeah. <laughs> Had to do it. <laughs> Excellent. So this is, this is a, the sort of... Um, that's sort of where the story started in Spain. Well, it, it started hundreds of thousands of years ago when the, the moon moth came, but this is when the first identified. And actually something yeah. from your filming uh, was something completely new, wasn't it? You didn't just manage to film the species, you managed to film something incredibly special, perhaps you can tell us about Yeah, that. We, we were lucky enough that night um, when working with Pedro and Jose to have actually filmed the Spanish moon moths mating. And we believe, believe that was the first time they've ever been filmed and documented mating in the wild. Um, it was absolutely incredible, especially for us and the story that we were trying to tell. Um, so, yeah, we were really lucky to be able to capture that moment. Let's take a look at that. And it's not the longest clip, and that's because you were trying not to disturb them, wasn't Yeah, it? we yeah. only had very limited amount of time with the light. We obviously had to respect the, um, their work as well. We, we didn't want to disturb them and, and, and interrupt the moment for them. Um, so we had like only a small window of time to get that footage. One important point to make is, you know, using the, the females as a, to, to attract the, the males. All of this wasn't just for the benefit of you guys, you know, to finally to see this moth that you're searching for. Uh, it's important research that's being done because there, there is a lack of data, isn't there? Um, is this species conserved? Uh, is it conserved in any sort of meaningful way? It has protected status, so that means you can't go out and, well, you can't find it, you can't collect it. Uh, without having a permit, uh, but it's not actually listed as endangered, despite only being found in so few locations in the world. Fair enough, where it is found, there's quite a few of them, but there's just this, this tiny pocket in the whole planet that you can find it, and uh, it doesn't have any conservation status because nobody knows just how many there are. Mm. Which is really surprising, given that it's such an iconic animal such an intriguing species, it, it kind of, you know, it's kind of worrying to think, well, if, if an animal that's iconic and historical as this species isn't getting that sort of attention from people, then what could that possibly mean for other species out there? And that's part of the inspiration, presumably, to go out and to make this. Yeah. Even if it started on a sort of, I want to go and find my favourite moth, actually it became something far more important. It, it was such an intriguing story. I mean, as the story unfolded, we were like, we want to make this, we want to tell this story, because we were finding out so many interesting things that other people hadn't heard. Excellent. Before we take some questions from the audience, uh, where can people watch the, the full documentary? You can find the full documentary on YouTube. Um, if you visit the website as well, oknature.com, you'll find a link on there. Um, but yes, yeah, the, you can watch the whole thing online. Um, and yeah, it'd be brilliant if you could support the documentary and share it. Yeah. Wonderful. Has anyone got any questions? Uh, it's amazing how quickly the time goes when we're talking about moon moths. But yes, at the back. They can stay dormant for about two years, but it just depends if you get snow the next year. Yeah, they, um, they, the, the, the adult moth, and this is something I hadn't, hadn't actually mentioned yet, that the adult moth, when it emerges from um, the cocoon, it only lives for about a week. Um, it doesn't feed, um, it literally hatches and has about a week to find a female and mate, and the male, females have to find the males. Um, so we really were against the clock. It's, they, they kind of start dying out around the start of June, and that's when we were kind of just, just at our end of our journey in Spain. If we didn't see it the night that we saw it, we probably would have had, had to have waited another year. Um, so we, we got quite lucky, really. Um, but they, they stay, yeah, they stay un, underground for, for around like seven, eight months until the following, following May. 
or following June, yeah. Excellent question, though. We don't have a cocoon from the Spanish moon moth, but we've got some reasonably closely related species uh, cocoons here for you. If you yeah, want to these are these are actually. I'll get up and. These are actually moths that I reared that were given to me when I was younger, which is something that actually got me into um, moths and butterflies. But this is actually a cocoon um, of which a silk moth would make. So you know what lovely scarves are made out of and curtains and stuff. So this is this is like silk um, and all of the Saturnidae. So this is so Spanish moon moth, the Atlas moth, these silk moths, this species here, they're all Saturnidae, um, which means they produce silk. Um, these two species here are silk moths, adult silk moths. They wouldn't be adults if they, were, if they were having silk made out of them, because I actually boil these in hot water to get the silk from them, whilst the caterpillar's still inside. But this is what they look like when they emerge. Um, but yeah, this is what it would look like, and um, the Spanish moon moth cocoon would roughly look something like that, yeah. But with more pine needles. With pine needles and instead stuff, Instead of yeah. oak leaves. Yeah. Excellent. So uh, if this talk hasn't quite been enough for you, your butterfly fix, please do come down and, and come and talk to these guys afterwards. We barely got through half the things we wanted to talk about. Yeah. And if even that isn't enough for you um, and you want some more butterflies, our sensational butterfly house is still open out the front of the museum at a reasonable price for entry. Yeah. Um, and at the same time, uh, it's important to say as well that uh, the museum does an awful lot of work to, to look after uh, and protect and conserve and inform our decisions when it comes to looking after butterflies. Um, and you can do your own uh, work to help butterflies during the 20th of July and 12th of August by helping collect records in your garden or your local area by doing the big butterfly count. We're very lucky in, the, in that we have a lot of records in the UK, but we can always do with more recent um, records so we can keep an eye on, on changes of population. So this is a way that you can help some of the butterflies and moths here in the UK. Yeah. Um, thank you ever so much for all your questions. You've been a wonderful audience. As I said, please do come down and um, ask some more questions. Take a look at these lovely species. But if you'd all like to join me in saying thank you ever so much for Alicia and Ben for sharing their documentary with us and for a lovely Nature Live today. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Yeah, it's great.